Hello everyone and welcome to Beta Mails, the show where we play various beta games and let you know if they're worth uh, even trying out. I am your host, The Mangoose, and joining me, as always, is my better friend and co-host, Viking Jedi. <laughs> oh! <laughs> wow, he almost tripped up and then had to make up for it by insulting me, I get it. <laughs> sure, friend. Yes, I am the better friend, for sure, 100%. <laughs> okay, cool, it's fine, you know. At least what, the last two years of my life has meant nothing, Mangoose? Uh, at least, at least, je- just, at least just... Jelly's on time, though. At least Jelly's on oh. time. Oh. <laughs> also uh. joining us, he won't be on every show, but he has been so far, is my normal friend and co-host, Jelly Knees. <laughs> How you doing, Jelly? I feel like that's even more of an insult, right? <laughs> right? Like, not even, like, not even, I'm not even the better friend. I'm the normal friend and co-host. <sighs> oh, okay. Okay, cool. Thanks, Mangoose. What's wrong with normalcy, Jelly? Plenty of things. Um, oh. I, I am fantastic, though. I'm happy to be here talking about the game we're talking today, even though I won't be here every time. Um, I'm happy to be here a second time. And we're, the game we're talking about today is V Rising. It's a top-down, sort of isometric uh, action survival RPG vampire game. I know the last time we covered Blood Hunt, we're not just doing vampire games. It just, <laughs> it just happened to line up that way. Um I will say, I've got three games installed on my computer right now. All three of them are vampire related. <laughs> Same. Same. Really? What's the yeah. third one? Vampire Survivors, another early access game. Oh, okay. That maybe, well, maybe that's one we should talk about. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, the let's just game. keep the vampire theme going. Why don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to save all these episodes and just post them in October. It'll be our Halloween <laughs> special, all vampire there you games. Go. <laughs> So V Rising, we played the crap out of it, so we have experienced everything from early game all the way to late game, so I was very dazzled at first. (laughs) Special guests. Yeah, my fucking cat's going ballistic today. (laughs) So uh, I I was very dazzled by the game at first, but as we played, as we got more towards the end game, realized there's a few shortcomings with the game. I, I would not let that put you off. Um, let's ask this question right up front. It's It costs $20 to access the beta. We usually do free games on here, but this one costs $20. Mm-hmm. Do you guys think that $20 was worth it to play the early access for V Rising? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree. I got so much enjoyment out of that $20. Mm-hmm. And I think that you're still going to get value. As far as what I've uh, heard from this developer is they're not looking to make um, paid DLC for a while. So I think that they're going to still be releasing more content. Um, So your $20 is going to go even farther than it currently does. But I think the $20 right now is a huge value. Considering you can play it um, on official servers, you can play it on your own servers, so you can start playing with the rules and doing all that stuff, especially if you have like a larger community or, um, you know, or create like a discord for it or something like that. You can really start to, I think, find a end game that wasn't the developer's end game, but your own version of what that end game looks like. And so, yeah, your 20 bucks goes really far. Yeah. I mean, I always try to think about for like worthwhile of paying for something. If I, if I value my time at a dollar or $2 per hour of gameplay, mm-hmm. right. I've put 65, 70 hours into the game, mm. right? So that is so beyond paid for itself. And that was just in the first initial release of Early Access, right? right? As they release new content and I go back to it, that'll only increase further. And if you put 65 hours in, then I don't, I don't, I don't have to look it oh, up. But I, you've got like 120 or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have you have a lot. Probably more than that, I think. Um, yeah, I hit it. We, we I think we hit it a little too hard and a little too fast. Like we leveled up. <laughs> way too fast and got to the end game a little too little too quickly even though on our server there were people that got there days maybe even a week before we did i don't know how they got to top level but then they were just bored and ganking low level players and so i just looked at it mangoose 146.5 for for me for hours bleeding yeah (laughs) Uh, yeah, I did most of our solo farming, and as such, I think I probably experienced more of the PvP side of the game than you guys did. Mm-hmm. However, most of my mm-hmm. PvP was running away from high, like high level <laughs> duos and, and trios trying to gank me. But I, even still, I had the ability, the capabilities to outmaneuver them and fake them out, which was really fun. And I think mm-hmm. that's that's quite a fun aspect of this game is the PvP. Um, this is it's from Stunlock Studios, the same guys that made Battle Right. 
and it plays a lot like battle right like yep you have various spells that you can use and you have various melee attacks you can use you have different melee weapons and the different melee weapons have different abilities associated with them as you level up and uh just the just really good the pvp was so good it's a survival game and what i'm used to is like um conan exiles and arc and pvp in both those games sucks ass it's just mm-hmm. it's terrible um arc is just swing away at people and then whoever swings the most wins and then conan exiles it's stack as many status effects on your weapons as possible and then whoever hits the other person first wins because they apply all those status effects first so like this was actually skill based really fun like it didn't matter if you're gear if you're if you were lower level than the person you were fighting if you were Mm -hmm. more skilled than they were you could beat them and i think that's a very important aspect if you're going to introduce pvp into a survival type game yeah absolutely i think it vastly benefits them that they have pvp experience going into a survival game where like conan and arc developers have never made a pvp game right and so they they just pvp is a tacked on thing to their survival game where in this, I think PvP already was developed because of Battle Right, and so then they could develop a full survival game on top, and they equally have a place in the Horizon. Right. I think. Yeah. He, I, he, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jedi. Oh well, I was just gonna say. I think the the big reason why uh, PvP worked so well for me was that, um, and, and I know we'll touch more on it, but like the the weapons um, are your skills, right? So there's no like skill tree. There's no like. You know, special things you have to, like, you know, focus on. If you build a weapon, you get its skills that comes with it. And so I think when in a PvP sense, not just in the PvE, but PvP, you can start to find your niche, but it's always accessible to anyone. So it's not like you have to be necessarily, uh, you know, focusing on, you know, axes to only be able to have those skills. Like, you can have your sword, you can have axes, you have spear, whatever style and you can have access to all of them in a fight and they're on a global cooldown and so their ability share cooldowns which i think is great so you're not you know being able to um you know chain (laughs) op skills together but uh i think that was pretty neat and we all kind of found our own niche within those weapons of what we liked the most i think we all really liked the spear initially that was the one that we all really liked and then it switched to uh the reaper and then and then you guys kind of started going a little bit more towards the axes and you know and i was sticking with the reaper or the sword because I like the knock up um, so I thought that that added a lot of uh, freshness to you have to pay attention to their the weapon that they're using to know what skills they're going to use and there's only like three skills so it's not like super complicated but um, I think that helped facilitate the PvP in a, in a way that was more fun and not just feeling like oh I'm just going to suck because I don't have access to this skill tree or whatever that's right. the strongest yeah and then them coming from like a PvP environment it's mm-hmm. not like that. It's not like the the survival part sucks. No, they mm-hmm. learned from the mistakes that were made with like Ark and Conan and Rust. I guess there, there's a lot of little like survival games. Um, they've learned from that and they've improved upon a lot of those systems. And it's the survival part is absolutely amazing. And I mm-hmm. think the best part of the survival of the survival mode, you you don't unlock stuff just by leveling up, just by farming and building shit. You have to go out in the world and fight a PvE encounter that is mm-hmm. extremely well designed in order to unlock the recipes you need to advance your survival and your and your castle building and all that stuff. These PvE encounters blew me away. I know you guys really enjoyed yeah. them too. They scaled with um with the amount of people you had, so the more people you had didn't make it just extremely easy to just overwhelm the boss. Is it was actually a lot harder in many cases. Mm-hmm. To, to to go with a group against the boss than just solo it, but uh, there you had bosses running around the map, just like roaming, which you would run into, which was always like a butt puckering experience when you're low, when you're way low, too low level to be fighting that boss, and then you had bosses in specific areas that you had to fight, and every boss was unique. Every boss had unique mechanics. It was everyone felt like a Warcraft raid boss with all the different mechanics you had. Or more of a Guild Wars 2, I would say. But mm-hmm. holy shit, was it... I, I, I'll let you guys talk about it, because <laughs> <laughs> I could talk forever about how great the PvP, uh, the PvE you go first, options were. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I completely agree. I, the, the, the fights were, were so fun. I mean, it, it, you feel 
the uh, the level of excitement from first landing to all the way to the end game. Um, I mean, you're the, the roaming bosses. I think were the first like big like oh my gosh excitement moment <laughs> because um, if you like you were saying if you get caught out not only during daytime right so like that's one by the by the like, way part of the survival mechanics having daytime um, oh, and the, yeah. the night the light and night cycle even though it's so frustrating sometimes getting stuck out you know during daytime. And then you might encounter one of these roaming bosses that has knockbacks and will destroy, you know, the environment around you. And so you'll lose more shade. And it, it was, there was so many hectic call outs and, okay, I'm just disengaging this way. Every man for himself. <laughs> like we're all just running because we have materials that we really need to get back to. But it was so much fun. And then when you get to the more organized, um, I, I love that there was different setups needed for each one. Some of them you just walked into a cave. And you went and you fought boss, you know, and had to do all the mechanics. Some of them we had to farm up potions to be able to even get into the area so we could withstand, you know. I don't want to give away too much to people who haven't played yet. But, like, you know, you will have to, like, you know, utilize your survival and, and, and crafting to get to some of the bosses. Um, and some of them won't be accessed until you unlock other powers that you get. And I think that was the other thing. All the PvE bosses unlock another power or skill or magic ability that you get um which further enhances you as as a vampire and feeling like a you know badass you know vampire i don't know i i the, <laughs> the mechanics were really well done and graphically they were done really well too i think for a like you know top down it still captured 3d environment you still felt like you were having to dodge things in a way um it, it was very very intelligent especially for early access i i, I was blown away by how how cool it looked and felt while playing yeah absolutely i think and you bring up so the the day night thing is complete opposite of every other survival game right in every <laughs> other true. survival game you're like ah daytime the time to go outside and do things right and the second it's getting dark then you're panicking whereas this one the panic comes almost entirely from sunlight like it's just oh god the sun's out like i am i do i have enough that i can hop shade spot to shade spot to <laughs> not burn instantly uh, which is super, super cool. And the boss it fights, is. I loved that basically every boss fight was different. It didn't feel like even like an early game boss versus a late game boss. It didn't feel like they recycled a mechanic, mm -hmm. right? The only ones that recycled mechanics were ones that were of similar like faction types. Right. That it made sense that they all use similar type skills that I was like, okay, mm -hmm. you, lore wise, that makes sense. Um, and I think that's excellent. And, and, having different factions right the the pve being able to go around the map and you have skeletons that are roaming around that will fight the humans that are roaming around that will fight the werewolf or the wolves that will roam around right like that's such a cool it makes your world feel lived in and feel yep. important because you've got it's not just you versus the world because in games all the time you go like why are they not fighting that wolf because that what they hate wolves just as much as i do why are they <laughs> fighting it and so this was cool to see that come together and and you've got like harpiness and eventually you'll see roaming guards fighting the harpies because they mm -hmm. had and like it's such a cool idea to have all that interaction the boss fights the whole nine yards i mean and I the boss fight, one... okay it's not enough to just have the best gear in the boss oh, fight. It's truly you need to understand the mechanics it's not just go in there oh i've got 10 levels on this boss i'm just gonna slap him down and walk away no 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 because if you even higher level you can still go into a boss fight and die just as easily because you refuse to play around the mechanics that are involved in that fight yeah i was just gonna kind of touch on a tangent was uh we i know we tried to even like sometimes take encounters where we can pull the npcs or opposing npcs into the the roaming boss or whatever so we'll have like a you know rock monster fighting the boss at the same time <laughs> and using him as a tank and stuff it was it was super cool to your point i, I love that part yeah, well, but the, even one but, of the boss fight fingers that you and I did was that frog boss. Oh God, <laughs> where he would he would eat me, and our damage just got halved just instantaneously. Yeah. yeah, and then I'm just out of the fight for ten seconds, twiddling my thumbs. Like, can I can I press buttons again, please? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a pain in the ass because out, and two seconds later he'd eat me again. <laughs> you built for the bosses. You built very survival survival. Mm -hmm. A lot of survivability, I, I'm trying to say. Like, you had a lot of healing spells and stuff like that, so you were able to last in those boss fights longer than I was. I would get in, deal as much damage as I could until I died, 
and then run back to the to the fight, deal as much damage as I could, you know. But um, in that fight, that option was off the table because he kept eating you, and then oh, holy shit, I also have to survive this. This is no bueno. Well, and we even had one time we were doing that boss mangus that you died and he ate me and de-aggroed because he technically had yeah. no targets and healed himself back to full health. <laughs> yeah. It was like, what are you, what? That's so not okay. While you were still inside While of him? While he was still in his mouth. He was wow. he just healed right in front of me. I was like, that's just not cool. Thank you, though. Like, uh, that's hilarious. And oh, the that's... thing is the boss fight, even when you understand the mechanics, the boss fights are not like 30 second or a minute fights. No. Right? The the last handful of boss fights are easily 15 to 20 minutes long. You'll go mm. through a full day cycle at least once, if not twice, in that single boss fight. And I think that's super cool that it felt like it was a it was a challenge. It was a task that even when you're playing well, it still is this rock, paper, scissors between you and the boss where at any moment you could screw up. And it's and Mangus referred to it several times like Dark Souls boss, mm-hmm. where mm. all it takes is one slip up and then it just beats the hell out of you real quick. Yeah. <laughs> That's well, the other they had multiple thing too. phases too, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that was a big one. I think was having multiple phases in in some of these boss encounters. So, like early on too, some of the early ones would have like a rage encounter or a rage mechanic or something like that. And then obviously the later ones definitely had like full on two, three phases of of mm-hmm. combat that you had to be prepared for. And yeah, it did feel like a souls like sometimes with the, those things. Yeah. Imagine that with a team, and then hoping that someone yells with PvP doesn't come in and also. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Mess which hap- which happened to us which happened uh-huh. to us and we happened to others <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh man it's it's um like when, when we say souls like it's not limiting like you will kill that boss eventually like you can learn their patterns learn how mm-hmm. to dodge them like when you first go in you're going to get hit by all kinds of shit but you learn the patterns you learn how to overcome it so it's not like the bosses are a huge stepping stone unless you're completely horrible at the game you're you're going to eventually kill that boss. That's not, yeah. or or, and um, I don't know. It's just I want to get back to the 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 nighttime the daytime nighttime cycle because that is so important to me because that's one of the things mm-hmm. I absolutely hate about survival games is nighttime. It just gets real fucking dark so that you can't see shit and it's mm-hmm. hard to do anything at all. It's hard to do anything at all when it when it's nighttime unless you turn your gamma way up and then your game looks like shit and then it's like well, that's no fun either. <laughs> Well, yep. with this one, like you can actually see better during the day, but if you're out in the sun for too long, you know it, it doesn't immediately burn you. Uh, over time, it builds up and eventually burns you. But you can jump from shade to shade and and actually maneuver and do stuff during the day. So there's no point in time during the game that you're just huddling in your base waiting for the day night cycle to to mm-hmm. repeat. And I, yeah, I didn't feel like it was a survival part of this game. 100% agree. I didn't feel like it was required that you had to stay in, right? If you if it just felt more like Kathleen didn't really like going out in the in the daytime as much. She didn't want it to deal with, you know, people coming up to her or whatever. So she'd wait for nighttime a lot of times, which you could do. Absolutely. The the night cycle is longer. Um, oh, and we didn't touch on it, but there's also a blood moon mm-hmm. as part of the cycle where you, your stats get enhanced during the blood moon, uh, which is also a fun mechanic. Um, so... Uh, and I do agree to to Mangus your point with the uh, boss encounters. I, I don't think any of them are impossible to beat. Like they're they're all very much possible once you learn the mechanics. Um, and I do think it's valuable too that um, the game rewards you for understanding and being patient. Like um, if you just constantly throw your face into the the mechanics and you're and you're gonna lose your gear. Your gear's gonna start and it's gonna cost you a lot of mats. So if you value your time in the game, you're not gonna want to die a lot a lot of times so you're going to pay attention to the mechanics you're going to slow down you're not going to just you know hack and slash your way through it like i did when i first started playing because that, that's what i was just accustomed to doing um you have to you have to pay attention you have to learn and i, and I liked that i liked that it was like you know punishing in a sense that you will have to go and repair your gear which can cost a lot of materials and time but um the day and night cycle i think was one of the coolest things even if it was somewhat frustrating sometimes when you got caught out but it was a good frustration it should be frustrating um, but I'd like that, yeah, there was no, it never felt like I couldn't be playing. Like there, there was nothing necessarily holding me back other than just me wanting to deal with it or not deal with it, which I thought was, again, to Mingus's point, really great, especially doing some of the deeper farming that we needed to do. Well, and as such, like usually in survival games, you have your bed, right? That mm-hmm. at night, if everyone's in their bed, the night, the night cycle pushes forward, right? It quickly cycles through. Mm-hmm. And this game doesn't have that at all. 
and mm-hmm. that and I think that helps evidence it's evidence to show that you can still do things during the daytime you can still progress and, and make things happen while you're waiting for the the optimal time to go do things sure um uh- Another thing that's really great about this game is the attention to detail and how they bring in vampire lore into it. Like we have already talked about the sun burning you, but you get you're able to transform into various animals and just mm-hmm. the the attention. Like there's such cool stuff out in out in the world. Like we we would observe caves. We're like, well, how the hell are we supposed to get to there? Maybe there's like some sort of form or something that we can unlock. Because we unlocked wolf form fairly early into the game, and and sure as shit, you can unlock bat form or or frog form, which that's one of my problems with the game is frog form did absolutely nothing for you whatsoever. But uh, it was like, why did we even have this? Maybe it'll be later instances of the game you'll need frog form, but yeah, for now it kind of sucks. But um, yeah, and then little stuff like you, you had a town full of werewolves, and like mm-hmm. during the day they're just humans walking around. There were aggressive humans that would attack you, but at night they would all werewolf up <laughs> all at once, and it would turn into a town of werewolves, yeah. and one of the mechanics of the game is you can tame people, so you can tame a human during the day, but if it turns nighttime while you're bringing them back to your base, they hulk out, werewolf out on you, and then you got to fight them. Mm-hmm. And it, that, yeah. that is such a cool attention to detail sort of thing that I really loved about it. Well, and the werewolves are fairly high level. So, like, our base was in a relatively low level area, right? Several times I would go tame one of those werewolf humans, try to bring them back into our base. Halfway home, it would flip the nighttime. The werewolf would hulk out, and I would be piecing out because I don't want to fight him. <laughs> right? And then he's just like terrorizing bandit camps, just running around <laughs> fighting bandits. It's like, oh my god! Like he, I just massacred a village secondhand. Like I, I didn't even. <laughs> yeah, if you're having a problem with the boss, try and find them while you have one of those humans. Oh god! <laughs> and wait until it turns nighttime and let the werewolf, let the werewolf beat him up for a while. <laughs> I bet that would work. Actually, there, there were so many, <laughs> there were so many of those instances where we weren't sure it would work. And I love um, games that don't like you know have like a fun detected mode where they say, "Oh, these guys are having fun doing things you're not supposed to do." Let's you know remove that mechanic. Uh, I, I I would love that idea. Actually, that's so funny. I wonder if that would work if we could just grab a few humans and <laughs> take them into a boss area, wait for it to turn night, and then see if they go nuts on the boss. That would be hilarious. I'm to sure watch. they would. I'm sure I, they I, would. Yeah, I'm sure they would too. I think it would be funny. Um, but you guys, I think talking about the taming aspect of the game, that was another because um, there's two two parts to it, right? There's one where you can have, create um, your own little minions uh, that will, their servants, I think is what they're called in game. Um, And you can have them guard your castle or like, so they'll just naturally roam around. You can gear them up, send them out on missions, uh, which you can set for different timers. And um, depending on their gear level, um, they can, you know, accomplish more material. So you can have like passive farming, which I think is something new for a survival game. I've never seen it before where you have like, NPCs essentially being able to help you with your, you know, material, you know, intake, um, which I thought was really neat. And I, from what I could gather, it doesn't necessarily take away from the experience of other players on the map. It's just na- they go off on this mission. They're not actually roaming around on the map, so people won't be able to kill your your servant or anything like that. But they come back, you know, after a certain amount of time with all the materials that you sent them. If they didn't die, they can die, but. Uh, and, and I love that. I thought once we got, especially towards the more of the end game, we really started like meta gaming, you know, oh, we need to get higher blood types because it affects their gear score and we need to do this, you know, and um, and I thought that type of mechanic in a, in a survival game was something I hadn't seen before. I don't know about you guys, but. Uh, Ark, you can do it a little bit, but not. Not nearly to that extent. Not, not yeah. to that extent at all, no. <clears throat> um, th- that's the other thing is the blood types. You Like mm-hmm. various things had different blood types. And you would get aspects of that blood type if you ate that thing. Like creatures, if you ate a creature, you got increased movement speed, increased resistances. And each thing had a percentage of blood. Like it was 7% pure blood or um, 78% pure blood. And the higher that blood percentage, the more um, the more effective the blood was. So you would specifically fight like uh, we would look for brutes a lot. The brute yeah. blood type would give you um, life steal on your melee hits, and it would mm-hmm. increase your, your item level, which mm-hmm. was important in the game, because the higher your item level is, the more damage you deal to, to PvE objectives and the less damage you take. And then um, 
you could actually look for humans with like a hundred percent blood, tame them, bring them back to your base, imprison them, and you could draw blood from them and put it in like glass bottles, and you could save that blood for later. It, that was such a cool mechanic. Like, oh, so yeah. cool. Now you have to feed them. Like, you can't just keep draining them and draining them. You have to keep them happy with certain fish, which that's an aspect of the game that needs to change right there. But uh, we'll get into that later, I guess. That's I, and I completely agree, Magus. I think it's a, the whole imprisoning system. The first time I imprisoned somebody, I was like, "You can do this! Like, what is <laughs> this? This is so cool!" Yeah, right. Like being able to yeah, you find a hundred percent brute blood, right? And then you imprison the person, and now you and your entire team can just hold a hundred percent brute blood on your person, so that when you need blood, you just throw it back, right? And then you're good to go. And I think that's the coolest thing. I wish you could tame. I wish you could imprison creatures that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's apparently something in the files that says that maybe you'll be able to going in the future expansions. Uh, and I, I just think they've done a really good job of getting like the subtleties of lore about vampires right. Like having your thralls, having the prisoners, having... right Because people always ask, like, well, if vampires existed, they'd have to get a consistent blood source. How do mm-hmm. you do that thing? How mm-hmm. do you go to blood banks and steal something <laughs> off the shelves? Right? Like... What's what's the play? And so in, in this case, giving yourself that dedicated blood source that you have to yeah. then manage and take care of at the same time is really cool. Oh, that's another attention to detail thing. The mosquitoes in, in the swamp have different blood types because they fed on something that has a different blood type. That was yep. such a neat little detail. It is. It easily could have been creatures and it wouldn't have wouldn't have pulled anything away from the game. But having them be different blood types yeah. add so much to it at the same time. Yeah, I, I know. Um, I, I That was all like I, I was so surprised by the, the those little details that they didn't need to put in. Like it wasn't something that was like a requirement by any means. But they really leaned so heavy into the idea of using different blood types that even yeah, mosquitoes will have the different blood. And you can kill a mosquito or and drain it of its blood. And, and I thought that was cool. And I like how much the blood aspects permeated throughout the whole, you know, game. So you needed, you know, you would get, you know, blood essence as a drop from, um, you know, every mob that you would kill basically had blood essence. You use blood essence to make, you know, greater blood and you can use all those to craft items. And um, I, I just thought that it was, it was intelligent. Oh, and for your base to be able to keep it alive, you know, you had to have blood essence to put in there. Um, so it really, really leaned, I think, well into capturing that you are a vampire, you need blood, and you need this, and your blood pool on your person drains over time, so it's not something you just have as a constant. Um, if you want to heal yourself, it drains faster. So it's like you're constantly paying attention to your blood, and sometimes you're just like, I don't care what blood. I just need blood. Give me blood. I do, <laughs> you know, and you can get blood from your fellow vampire, which I think is cool. So in a pinch, you know, you can open a vein and you know go to town. Uh, I, I just, I, I love that. I love that you have to keep the servants alive or the um, the imprisoned uh, people alive with, you know, feeding them in order to keep it going. I, I, I just thought that was uh, so neat. I, I loved it. Um, I also like that uh, to command your servants, you had to have a throne. So you get to sit on your throne of vampiredom <laughs> and you know, send out your, your minions. And uh, I thought that was uh, very cool. And then we haven't even touched on the bases yet. I, I know Jelly really loved the base building. So if he wants to dive into that, I, I um, at the bases were insane in this yeah. game. It's, it's nuts. Think, so one of the big things is the for the for the base building right is it's you had the pvp aspect if you were playing on a pvp server you had to worry about right so honey homing honeycombing very popular in survival pvp games mm-hmm. right and so that's really interesting but i i before we get into bases i want to talk about the we are playing on an official pvp server right it wasn't one started by somebody it was an official server the devs had and usually official servers for survival games, at least in Ark's case, because I didn't play mm-hmm. much Conan, is the grind on those official servers is unreal. Mm-hmm. Like being able, if for Ark specifically, <clears throat> being able to find the resources you want, being able to tame dinos takes an eternity. And so for an official server, it was it grindy toward the end? Absolutely, right? Scourge Stones probably being the, the biggest ones, the biggest resource that was hardest to get and the most grind for. But it didn't scale nearly as hard as those other games do. And I think that is a huge benefit for V Rising that you can, you still feel like you're being productive without like, 
oh great i got three scourge stones and now it, i have to wait 45 minutes for it to reset like it's it's terrible well um, i think your opinions of that are a bit skewed because I was on during the day constantly farming, so you didn't. You guys, <laughs> well, so you guys didn't have to. You guys to didn't have to sure. farm as much. To be sure. It wasn't as grindy as those other games, but it was pretty grindy. Um, well, I, like I said, I, it still was grindy. I'm not saying yeah. <laughs> it, it is not a grind, but, it, but comparatively to Ark, it is definitively lower. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 100%. <clears throat> um, and that, that, I think, is a really cool thing to see, is it didn't take a private server that somebody started where they fine-tuned the resources to get it to feel good. This was an official server that was already in a decent spot for the first run to a public release, basically. Um, I, and I think Mangus can attest to this, too. Um, I, I didn't farm nearly as much as he did, but I would jump on during the day with him and, and help out farming. Um, you know, he was on a lot farming. He really was going for it, guys. He, he, Mangus was really enjoying the game. And, uh, I got a little I lost in just, it. <laughs> yeah, but which is a good thing, by the way, guys. So if you're like a, you know, like a Mangus who just loves to go out and chill and, and, and farm up and find resources and, you know, be that guy on a team, like the game will reward you for it. It's, it's, it's very fun. I don't think even doing the same cycle that you were doing was boring because there's always something kind of thrown at you that you might not expect. Um, so the grind is to me was never mindless. Like you still had to pay attention and be ready for some random encounter that you might not be expecting or somebody to be farming in the same area. And now you have a PVP fight on your hands. Um, but it, I, I think what was cool about the end game and part of the farm was that there were somewhat multiple paths to get some of those like scorch stones you could make in your base took some, you know, additional materials that were, um, you know, their own grind to get, but they weren't as grindy to get as just farming straight scorch stones. For example, you could, you know, the, the grape dust or whatever it was, was a little bit easier to come by, but not in massive amounts. So you could have at your base, your gravestones making you more score stones while you're farming grave dust and score stones. So um, I liked that aspect that it wasn't like all of your time is just out in the world and being wasted, not wasted, but like that that's the only way you can acquire materials, that there were multiple avenues to get the end game stuff that you needed. Um, and, and, and again, Mingus can probably go way more into detail because he did the majority of our farming. But um, how did you feel about that? Like as far as the, the farm, especially towards the end game? Um, well, I think the nice thing is a lot of the times the stuff you need was all in the same place. If mm -hmm. it wasn't all in the same place, then it was stuff you needed for other stuff would be there. Um, the big thing of farming late game was gold chains, like the gold jewelry, because that was the only way you could make golden bars. But as you're farming the golden jewelry, you get schematics, which help you unlock um, new gear and stuff. And you mm -hmm. also get glass, which you needed to make scorch stones. So, like, there was uh, multiple things you needed in a certain area. I couldn't just go to that one area to get absolutely everything I needed, but that was, it was it was really nice. It was really nice to have everything grouped up in one spot. And it was indicated on the map, if you hovered over a certain area of the map, mm -hmm. it would show you uh, you're going to get scorch stones and bones and grave dust at this place. Or you're going to get yeah. you know gold chains and fish oil and fish at this place. I think so, for survival games, it's very new player friendly. It's very, oh, you can go yeah. in there. And yeah, and being able to hover and be like, oh, okay, this is where I get iron. This is where I get, just because you've passed by the area before, mm -hmm. right? That's a super cool thing because yes, in other survival, the arc especially, right? You go in there and you're like, well, I know I need iron for the thing, but I have no idea what iron looks like. I have no idea where to find it. <laughs> I have no idea where it is. Oh, it's in a volcano <clears throat> three fourths of the way across the map. Fine. I guess it's over there because that's what a player told me, right? And I think that's another thing that helps be rising a lot is their teleporting system mm -hmm. and the, the teleporters and also the cave systems the the teleporters you could not use they were basically like one-way travel most of the time we use we use them a lot to go to cover the majority of the distance to go somewhere and then would go do our thing and then have to run all the way back to base because you couldn't have materials on you and use the teleporter but they also had cave passages which act as another form of teleporter but you could carry gear through those they're more rare. They're more defined in where they take you. So if you, you had to know you're taking the right cave passage to get to the area you want to go. But it gives you that that fast travel where you can go get resources and get back rather than spending 20 minutes running there, 20 minutes there and 20 minutes running back. Right. Like it it to me felt like it was a much more streamlined version of a lot of those things that help 
reduce the like grindy feeling of it all because you're you're in and out faster you're not taking an exorbitant amount of time to go and do all those things I agree. I think one of the other ones, and I'm sure Mangus will uh, again agree with this, is that I liked that none of the end game uh, materials that you need to make like your gear or any of that stuff was behind a boss encounter. So everything was in the, relatively in the world. Like there were things that were difficult to kill that you needed to get it, but it wasn't like you'd have to go in for a 20 minute boss fight to be able to get, you know, said item. Like it was, there was ways to get it out in the world, which... To me, what made it, you know, to again, you could put on some music, go just to an area and, you know, do your route, find a random horse, run it back. <laughs> By the way, I think towards the end there, we had like 15 horses out yeah. in front of our base. <laughs> it was hilarious. Uh, the horse mechanics into itself were also super yeah. cool, guys. Like the, the, the different horses, they have like different stats for them. You have to water them, which was also really fun. Um, I think it got to a point where we didn't even really worry that much. I think I was the only one who still had my horse, um, you know, but uh, it, it got to a point where we were just getting so many horses so quickly we really weren't paying attention to it. That, they could probably fine-tune that. I think it would be cooler if horses felt like more of a, a, a resource that wasn't just so plentiful, but uh, that that it was really funny how many horses we ended up with just it's because Main Goose was going out, running back, going out, running yeah. back. He was <laughs> running out to... <laughs> horses on the road and just putting free horse and just yeah. <laughs> letting people take them i was spamming in chat like hey newbies if you need a horse <laughs> just come to our base there's literally just a bunch of them sitting out in front we worked so hard for our first horses and i thought that was going to be like a thing that we had our horse and it was going to be so rough to lose the horse in yeah. game i was treating them like disposable napkins like yeah oh, let me go pick up this horse and fucking throw it over here hey there's some wolves go play with the wolves horse <laughs> yeah like even I, early on, like, yeah, we all had a horse, right? And yeah. we, like, take it somewhere, and when he would die, he'd be like, no, I have to go back for my horse. Like, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in-game, none of that. None of that. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so this might be a slight divergence, but so we're all, since we're all talking about horses and travel modes, uh, how did you guys feel about the fact that, like, if you got hit by a player or an NPC or something like that, you would get, like, taken off your horse or popped out of your travel mode? I think it needed to be adjusted to, like, level of what's hitting you sort of thing like uh that's kind of a thing in world of warcraft like whenever you get hit while you're mounted it takes like a big hit to, to dismount you but mm -hmm. like even any crossbow 10 percent threshold or something right yeah like if they do 10 percent of your health right <clears throat> then you get knocked off or knocked out of the transformation or whatever it is right I, I in my head i think of it as like concentration spells in dungeons and dragons right it's not just get hit lose concentration it's get hit and then you have to determine based on that hit if you lost concentration and so i think it it'd be better that way but yeah, that's an easy easy thing that they could theoretically change in the future i agree i know for me it was uh especially trying to run through like during the daytime and you're you know running from crossbowmen and magic spells that getting thrown randomly and <laughs> And one of you guys is like behind me or whatever, and you're getting the extra crossfire yeah. as it try, and you're trying to the horse mechanics of moving is not great. Like it's it, it they there, there are horses that move maneuver better than others, but even still, they're not like super agile. Which I mean, they're horses, but like considering <laughs> how much it takes, it literally you a just, bullet hell real fast. <laughs> oh my gosh! And you get hit by one, you get dismounted, you're slowed, and then like, and now you have like. 20 mobs coming at you it's uh yeah so i think that was one of the more frustrating things like things i didn't like was that was that it um really punished you for trying to just run around mobs and maybe that's something to be said it's a survival game don't run through the mobs kill your way down but yeah. when you're trying to farm as a, as quickly and as efficiently as possible it, it seems like the better way um and the other thing too was the the shift jump off cliffs was real glitchy sometimes it wouldn't work the way you needed it to or as fast as you wanted it to um but yeah so i, I actually would love to if we could tr transition because i know our video is getting long to the things that we you know would like to see them improve on um you know things that, that made the game not a fun enjoyable moment uh and then because i think that'll also transition a little bit into what jelly wanted to talk about with uh, the bases and the buildings and stuff like that um because i think of most of the stuff that we didn't like were maybe the end game, especially end game PvP. Um, if you're on a PvE server or on your own solo server, you probably won't encounter these frustrations. So everything that we've said up until this point is probably 
again, going to be just all fun and you're just going to really enjoy the game. But if you wanted to play PvP, wanted to enjoy the end game PvP, um, <laughs> yeah. So, what do you guys go ahead and take it I away? Mean, so, I, I will preface this because I know I'm going to get upset about this and I feel like Mangoose <laughs> probably will too. Uh, I will preface this that I really enjoy this game and I recommend you go out and get it. And everything I say after this point is just a frustrated like person who wants this game to be better. Yeah. Right? It is not it is not that I hate the game. It is not any of those things. This is pure just frustration from mainly the the end the end most game that there is at the moment. Yeah. Right. And in this niche environment, right? Like it's again, yeah, if you're on a PvE sure. server, you're probably not going to worry or encounter this stuff. Yeah. This is this is PvP, and it's not hardcore PvP. We did not. So it's not mm -hmm. full loot drop. It's just resource drops. Um. So the end game, the way it works, and I think this is a cool, really cool idea, is that the final three bosses in the game have shards, and if you are the first team on the server to kill that boss, you get the shard, you take it back to your base. And then you can consume the shard every so often and get a buff for your team based on the three shards that are available. So there's one that gives you resources, there's one that gives you better immunities, and there's one that gives you movement speed? I don't remember what the third one is now. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but there's three shards currently. So the for on our server specifically, the first team that was at the end game got all three shards, put it in their base. When we got to the point that we were under able to see the shards, know where they were, all of that good stuff, right? Then then that's the the real end game for V Rising is you trying to siege bases, trying to claim these shards for you and your your team, right? To then be the best and base and then it's defending your base when you have the shards. So that's that's the give and take of the theoretically living server will be the constant struggle of defending and attacking bases to keep these shards in play. For us, there was the one team that got there, like Mangu said earlier, maybe like a, a week prior to the rest of us. They were there almost instantaneously. They were the only ones on the server at that point. And then slowly but surely, two or three other teams kind of got there at the, around the same time. We coordinated with those teams to try and basically work together to siege this base. And then we were going to split the shards evenly among us. And then it was going to be a free-for-all afterwards of like, great, we worked together, <laughs> we defeated the final boss of the game, and now you're my enemy again. Congrats. Like, we, we all knew that that was what was going to happen afterwards. Right. Um, to do base sieging, you had to craft a siege golem. Late game, that is the only way to start a base siege, is you have to craft a siege golem, which takes an insane amount of resources. And I mean, time. the biggest yeah. one being 16 Scourge Stone. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so working with these this other team, right, we had five siege golems dropped at the same time to try and go siege this three-person base. And we cracked five walls, maybe, but with all five of those siege golems. Yeah. And then basically by then it's over. Like, we're all at the same power level, so we can PvP. But every time you die, your gear takes an insane amount of damage. Yeah. So by the time you die two or three times, all of your gear is broken. Yep. Which means you don't have any power to then push forward through the walls. Uh, and you can't beat on a wall while getting beat on. Like, you got to mm -hmm. turn and fight, and there's a timer. Yep. So. Yeah, so once you break the first... So in the Siege Golem, you have five minutes of the Siege Golem, and that's it. And then after you break the wall, every wall you break, it starts at five minutes and goes up to a seven-minute cap that you can then go in and actually loot the base. But when you're at that late of the game... And this is where the base building comes in. Those bases, I mean, honestly, the, the three of us that were at the top of the server, I would say, the three teams that were at the top of the server, all three of our bases were effectively unsiegeable. If, if the team was online, if the team was online and could defend their own base, all three of our bases were effectively unsiegeable. There was no way you were going to get all the way to the back of the base and get those resources effectively. Yeah. Yeah, it, and it, I go ahead, go ahead, Mingus, please. The the siege golems, the, the I mean, that was the big problem. Like, mm -hmm. it would take like uh, like a minute and a half or something like that for them to spawn, and you had to defend them, which that was really cool. But once they spawned, like Jelly and I are in a siege golem, we're both at a hundred percent. All of a sudden, I see his just explode. I'm like, God damn, they must have really unloaded all their ultimates on him or something. And then mine just pops, just like mm -hmm. one person hit me with a stun, and my siege golem exploded. 
from 100% health to zero, just like that. And it's like, what the hell's going on here? Like, that has to be something, there has to be something wrong here. So, yeah, the late game PvP, uh, somebody did finally, um, I know you guys kind of haven't been playing, but somebody did finally take those those mm-hmm. shards. But it was an offline, offline raid that they went, like, a weird offline route, and then... It, by that time, the the top team just didn't care. Like they haven't been playing because they they've done everything they can do. So right. that's just not exciting at all. Like the top team, like if if it would have been fun with those siege golems, that would have been absolutely amazing. But all of them just popped, like like goddamn balloons, and it was just very anticlimactic and not fun for either the defending team nor the offending teams. Mm-hmm. So then the the team that finally got those shards. They just offline those guys, and like that's not fun for anybody either. Mm-hmm. I, I know I'm for <clears throat> I know Mangus is specifically because you did the majority of the farming. That was like a super defeating feeling, right? Like, oh god, I know yeah. me and me and Jelly and uh, and my wife guys who was, was also our fourth. We did our our fair share of farming, but Mangus by far. I mean, you saw his hours in game. He played the most. He he was farming like crazy. Um, and and if you're somebody who doesn't have the time and you spent I don't know, man. If you were just playing after work, it would take you a good three days probably to make one siege golem. Um, and it wasn't this thing too, not to be completely negative. Like the, on this official PvP server, you know, it was fun keeping track of like the alliances. Like I had a, a, a sheet with all the names of people that I encountered. Um, you know, I, I do think, and that's another gripe. I, I wish that there was a better way to see who is who and what teams they're on. Cause you can make, you can make a clan, uh, and you're, but it, we can see who's all in our clan and we get a name for our clan, but nobody else sees it. There's no like little bar under their name to tell you that they're part of a clan or anything like that. So it, that part I think could, could use some adjustment as well. But, um, yeah, it just, the pure amount of investment that it was going to take and they were, yeah, the, uh, the top team was like begging for people to try and take their base. Like they were asking in chat, like, Hey, when is people, you know, and we were one of the top teams and we were talking and, you know, going back and forth and, it, and we, we were all, I think really, really looking forward to it. It was, you know, hectic and exciting. And, and then for it to basically be over in less than five minutes mm-hmm. was And again, and all the gear, the gear, like my, all of my gear was broken and it was, we spent, I think the next day and a half farming just to get my gear unbroken, uh, after that siege, like it, because of uh, the level that we got to, to be able to get, like, you just took so much material, took like, you know, dark silver and all this, it was just insane. Um, and so it was, I know for me, it was like a big pullout moment. Like it was just like, I just, I don't know. There's no point in really feeling like I'm I'm in gonna enjoy finishing this game in a in a in a fun way. Like it, it made it made a bit, bit of a of a sour taste to end it in that mm-hmm. in that context. Um, I hope that they figure that out sooner than later. That they need to have the shards on like a timer or something like that. Like that, that someone could hold it in their base for. I don't know, maybe like a week or two. I don't know. I'm sure there's a way to cycle it uh, and then have them go back to those end game bosses because otherwise. If you're only able to do it through sieging and in sieging in its current form, if it doesn't also get adjusted, is the only way to realistically get them. Then it's just going to go from one super team to the next super team to the next super team. And and, and if you're uh, a casual player or a casual team that still wants to PvP and be aggressive, you're never really going to get a chance to to have them or uh, and, and meaningfully get to take advantage of that end game mechanic, which is those shards. Um, so I, I do hope that that's something that that's probably the biggest thing they need to take a look at is, is this end game sieging and, and all that stuff. Um, so we'll see what that looks like, but well, and something that would help a lot is like I said, we coordinated with another team to try and siege the space. And in that, there's no way for us to even temporarily ally ourselves mm-hmm. so that if we're fighting next to each other, we're not hitting each other at the same time due to the PvP. So the game wants you to do basically one one team versus one team sieges, which in that case means we would never get into that. It wouldn't no. like if it, we pulled away the three of us when we were sieging that base, pulled their entire team toward us, that we were fighting them the majority, and then the team we were working with did get further into their base than we did. But even still, them not fighting, being PvP'd at all, only got four or five walls in, mm-hmm. whereas we got two like yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and we're pvping the whole time like it just 
there was no good feeling to come out of that of the eight and like Mangu said before even the defending team didn't think that that was any fun no right that they they were expecting like this is the moment like that we've been building toward this they knew we were working with other teams they knew we were coordinating right that was and i love that i was on discords with these guys like okay every day talking about like okay what do you guys have we have two siege golems all right well i think and then they would send me like a shot of the base and i'd be like okay you guys go here we'll go over here like and like full on planning the siege for it to be up in three to five minutes just felt terrible and then have to do the grind to get all your gear back and then have to do all of these things it just felt terrible like it was just not rewarding in the slightest for how much we had to spend for it and for how quickly it was over at the same time i mean and when you drop the siege golem it announces to the whole server oh yeah it dropped. and it so puts it on the map and put, exactly and puts a marker on the map so i mean we didn't have it luckily this too much but there absolutely were other teams that had no vested interest in there but they came and if they wanted to they could have also just pvp'd and killed us and fought and you know and did defended if they wanted to or the worst case scenario they could have tried to vulture off of our siege and our thing to steal some of the materials that would if we were able to crack the base they could have just taken shit and so it was I, that yeah all of that encompassing is is a is a frustrating ending to a beautiful amazing game like it, yeah. it, again guys it, this game is awesome for 20 bucks especially it's amazing it the pve even the pvp in the world i think is great like it's fun like the voip being native in the game too so there's plenty of times where we would be you know encountering other teams like oh bro okay hold on we're not trying to fight or whatever or you know the other way around we're going in there and we're like hi hey give us the resources or we're gonna kill you uh <laughs> and i think that's that's fun that's that that was a, a great part of it but this this sieging the base is being so massive i mean we figured out because kathleen ended up making her own base as well so all of your team members can make their own heart which means that they can build their own base and if they level it up you can i mean we essentially had in the that bottom left of the base uh, the, we had probably i don't know 25 percent of it as part of our team's base and i mean they're all connected everybody can use it and so it was it was insane and, and there was no way any other team reasonably was ever going to crack and get to the point where they could you know even just to go for resources let alone try and get shards and all that other stuff just getting to the resources inside of a base would be virtually impossible and probably at that point because it took so much to make the siege golem not even worth it you're just like you know what it would be easier for me to just go and get the materials from the npcs like the only thing that makes raiding bases especially end game is those shards and if you can't get to the shards then it's like okay well then i guess i'm at the end game if those don't exist now because they're just somebody else's and i can't ever get to them then i, I beat the game good for good for us no and that's uh a huge problem in PvE that we didn't experience because we didn't play PvE is people building bases in such a way that it cuts bases off and isolates them on an island so they can't get in or out of their base. And they can't they can't just move their base because you can't travel with resources, so... Oh, I didn't even think about the griefing. Yeah, and the there's contagious. absolutely nothing that they can do about it. Oh. So yeah, that's, that's kind of terrible. But the thing I want to complain about, and this is a thing that... <laughs> People that played V Rising a lot, like I talked to Zeph a lot about this. Um, Zeph was one of the, I, I considered him the leader of that top clan that was on our uh, mm -hmm. on our server. Mm -hmm. Something to him and I bitched about quite a bit. The one thing, the main thing I would change about V Rising is the goddamn fishing. Because <laughs> late game, late game, the main thing you need late game is fish. Yep. But the fishing holes spawn randomly. You get one shot at that fishing hole. Once you fish it once, it's gone, and you don't get fish. Like, one out of five fishing holes, you'll actually get a goddamn fish out of it. And you need certain fish. Like, the late-game potions that you can make take late-game fish that you have to fish out of high-level areas, but it's so extremely rare to get those fish. Um, to keep your, your captives happy that you're draining blood from, you have to feed them certain fish. So fish is fishing is a major component to the end game of V Rising, and it is fucking terrible. It is yeah. horribly done. Um, yeah, that's that. That was my main complaint as as <laughs> as the farming specialist. 
is the damn fish. Like, oh, it sucks so bad. That was the main yeah. thing that people were looking for when they would gank you late game was they were, they were mm-hmm. trying to get fish. <laughs> I think we encountered that a few times too when we talk about like the griefing as well. Like when um, early game, right? It was around the copper vein, right? There were some of the bigger teams that built their base literally like right across the way from the copper veins, and they would just go out, <laughs> kill anybody that's in there getting copper, get the copper themselves, go back to their base, and then and rinse and repeat. And um, and it was it, it almost for parts of the game or parts of the time impossible to get in there and try and get stuff and um you know and i guess that's to be expected but um it was frustrating i think that there wasn't like a way to consistently like again with the fishing i think is the biggest one because it's random where you can run to every little lake around your area or river and it won't there won't be any fishing holes ready for you to, to to grab from um and you can't like some of the other things you can make at your farm and you can like you know have plants growing that for materials that you get like you can get seeds and stuff but I can't make like a fishing farm. It's like I mean, we had a little, you know, stream and and lake area behind our base. I never once saw a fishing spot there. Never one time did I see one that spawned there, so we could safely from our cool base, you know, farm up the fish. And uh, I know it got to the point where basically when me and Bankers were running around, he's like, "If you see a fishing hole, go in there." And <laughs> yeah. Fish. yeah, and and there's no there's no leveling up That's your fishing hole, so you get. I know. It's such a weird one. thing for a late game for a game like it, this. It really is. And you only get the <laughs> one fishing. Every other weapon, every other thing you can level up. But the fishing rod, for some reason, doesn't level up. And I think that's something that can maybe help with this is if they level, you got to level up your fishing rod. Like a lot of other games have that. Or baits or something like that yeah. to where you can increase the percentage chance of getting the fish that you need. Uh, but yeah, no, it was funny <laughs> that the real grind was random drop percentages on fish <laughs> it's just Not the really. fact that you didn't always get fish oh it killed me like uh, oh i just got a flawless ruby who gives a fuck about this flawless <laughs> ruby give me a give me a fierce stinger fish that's what i want like, here you got some schematics I'm like i don't care <laughs> schematics even get down there uh that's so i mean i want to kind of close this out i know we're reaching the hour mark very quickly yeah. here yeah um that one thing that i really enjoyed I like a, i guess is a bright spot for me in this game and that wasn't at first definitively was the the voiceover ip and the pvp and the kind of people interacting with each other the actual players interacting with each other right early on we started fighting lydia the chaos archer right we were in there fighting her we really probably shouldn't have been fighting her to begin <laughs> with we were all pretty low health but we were fighting her because we fought her before on a previous server. And we we're like, we can take it. Like, it's fine. Right. And then that was when, funny enough, the team we teamed up with at the end of the game, um, Saren and his crew rolled up on us. And basically, we were all going like, uh, 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 hey, <laughs> hey, how's it going? Like, and they were, they were like, oh, we're not going to grief yeah. you guys. We're here to help. And they they helped us kill Lydia. We got the blood. We peaced out. Super cool. Uh, Mid game, that, that is when that highest team kind of got to that point and just started griefing the living hell out of almost everybody on the map basically yeah. making themselves an enemy to every single team on the map and it was because they were bored right they they reached the end game now what and so they're just running around killing people whenever they want and what are we going to do we're 40 levels below them that's not gonna we're not gonna be able to do much against that mm-hmm. um and so that was terrible. And that's kind of why we started the, like, no, no, no their base is going first. Screw yeah. them. Those guys are the worst kind of things. And But by the end game, after that siege, despite it ending in disappointment, right, all three teams that were a part of it, the defending team and then us and the other team that we worked with, all kind of sat around and talked to each other about it afterwards. Yeah. Of like, <laughs> yeah. we wish like this was better. Like And, like, kind of this, like, camaraderie over the fact that this siege was terrible on all sides. Yeah, and it was really, to me, that kind of it made me feel a little bit better about it, sure. despite it being disappointing. Being able to talk with them afterwards and not get the like griefing, like "screw you, you were trying to siege our base," Rah! like yeah, no, it wasn't that at all. Like once once the siege was over, the PvP stopped, and everyone was just kind of hanging around, talking to each other, trying to like trying to find a way that we all enjoyed the game. We wanted it to be better, so that that didn't feel as disappointing on all sides. And yeah. talking about that, and and even like. 
laughing at the moments of things that happen. Like, like, oh, you guys went in there and you saw our banshees, right? Like, <laughs> super, the super cool aspects. Like, that to me, even though it, I'm kind of salty about how, like, the, the last big time that we were all on playing together was, right? That is also a bright spot on that moment of the, of the, the counteracting point to that. Yeah, I 100% agree. I actually, the, the political and, and environment of it was actually some of my favorite moments. Like, I liked that we, uh, you know, developed a reputation uh, at, on the server and the, the people who were pretty consistently on, like, you know, you're going to run into people. Their bases are close to yours and you're going to be competing for resources. And so there was lots of moments where we were like, oh, do we let these guys live or are we going to, you know, fight them? Oh, well, Jedi just is now talking to them and he's letting them <laughs> live and you know, blah, blah, blah. And so it was, it, there was lots of, uh, I think, yeah, that, that interpersonal, uh, personal moments where you were um, forming alliances, temporary alliances, um, you know, and then full on just like, I don't give a fuck, let's fight everybody. Yeah. Um, and that was, it, it, I enjoyed that a lot. And in, in the global chat afterwards too, like I got into a 2v1 fight, I beat the crap out of those dudes. Like they, they fought me first, by the way. I, and now they were, <laughs> they were lower level than me, but they were, they started attacking me first. I was like, you, and I'm talking to them in VoIP. Are you guys sure you want to do this? And, then, <laughs> and, and they kept fighting me, so I killed them. And then in the in the chat, they were like, like, yeah, you really got us. And oh my gosh, and blah blah. And so it really did create like a lot of uh, fun moments. And I know Mangu's got a chance to talk to him a lot too. And it was so the the community aspect was was really neat. And um, I did like when we after we got done with the siege, he was he was showing us. He's like, oh yeah, in that room is you know these things, and you guys would have probably gotten you know and did the banshees even do anything like did they fear you or anything <laughs> yeah. like that and so because we had werewolves in our base by the way guys so we were trying to to also have some traps set uh it, it that part was cool it unfortunately just fizzled that it didn't get to its full fruition uh and i think a big part of that is just how in in overpowered the bases are uh and and, and, and i'm kind of hard stuck and i don't know how you guys feel about it because it's like I don't want to feel like my base is, you know, a paper bag and all my resources and all the stuff that I spent or, you know, Mangu spent out hundreds of hours farming for can just be gone and, you know, in one siege or something like that. But on the same token, if you have, you know, a limited resources like those three shards and one team's hoarding them, how do we get those in a reasonable manner also? And so I, I, I don't know what the solution is because it is a survival game and, and the big part of the survival game is the hour spent to survive and keep your, your base intact and all that stuff. I don't know. I don't know what the solution is. I don't know if you guys have thought about one, um, but I don't envy the devs and trying to find the solution that is their end game because they need to come up with one or they're going to have people like us who are, kind of leaving the game or stepping away from the game with a little bit of a sour taste. Like the, the grind up to the point was so good, but that ending feels not so good. And, and I don't think having one siege golem be enough to like break a whole base is, is healthy, right? Maybe it takes a couple tries or, or staggered siege golems or whatever it is. But when you drop five on the same base and barely crack five walls, that's terrible. Like that is yeah. just ridiculous. <laughs> and you've had you committed so many resources to get literal zero out of it is mm -hmm. insane to me. Yeah, I think it was the CC mechanics because I think I saw on the Reddit that people were talking about that CC somehow in one shots uh, people out of the because it pulls you out of the golem and there's no uh, current system for you to be able to get back into the golem if you get CC'd out of the form. So it's just like when you get dismounted from your horse or out of your travel modes or whatever, that basically while you're in there, if you get CC'd, it just insta-popped it. Um, which, again, yeah, with all the resources that it took, is a huge feels bad. Yeah. It did feel bad. I, I'm with you, though. I really like the, um, the proximity-based uh, voice activity. Uh, Created a lot of camaraderie or or hate hatred sometimes <laughs> in the server, but mainly camaraderie, especially among yeah. us solo farmers. Like, <laughs> I would roll into an area and see like Mephisto, be like, "Hey, Mephisto, it's Goose." He'd be like, "Oh, hey, what's up, man? Um, yeah, I'm done farming this area. I'm gonna go over here." I'm like, "All right, cool. I'm I'm just gonna pick up farming right here." Or like, you you have people that you'd run into, but if you ran into somebody you didn't know, you'd be like, "Well, I'm gonna kill that guy," <laughs> and then you'd kill him, and it'd be like, I'd be like. We already had the, all the schematics we needed. 
So the guy would be pissed that I killed him. I'd be like, all I took was your gold jewelry. I left you like a hundred schematics in a book. He'd be like, oh, cool. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. <laughs> so when he went to recover his body, he got the stuff he needed anyway. So yeah. I, don't know. I don't know. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I think that's going to about wrap it up, though. We went a little long on this. Uh, <laughs> do you guys have any thoughts on V Rising? And again, just want to reiterate, I think the game is worth the $20. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to be playing it for a while, but I will definitely be coming back to this game in the future once we have uh, maybe some patches or some downloadable content. Um, yep. Let's uh, send it over to Jelly. Jelly, any final thoughts? I, I can right there with you, Mangoose. I think it's definitely worth the $20, even despite those endgame frustrations. Had so much fun. Looked forward to playing it every day. Um, and, and look forward to playing it again when new content comes out. When like There's a whole area on the map that's currently unavailable, but you can see it there. Like When that becomes available, I'm super stoked to go explore yeah, two areas. it. And I've been, yeah, and I've been seeing like data mined information and i'm like ooh, like this is exciting like it's so it, so i'm excited to get back into it in the future for sure um i think it's fantastic i think a lot of people would probably enjoy it even if you're not if you don't like the stereotypical survival games like arc and conan i think this could provide a different aspect for you as a player that if you look at it and think like you know that kind of looks fun it might be worth giving it a try um, and Lejeni, if you're out there, give me a call, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I completely agree. I echo the guys' points. Um, I do think that there's a lot of opportunity, too, for uh, players of all types. So if you're more of a casual player, you can absolutely make your own server, um, you know, and have friends join it, and you can make your own rules about it, and, and just en enjoy the PvE aspect. I would say, um, and you guys can you know, you know, throw your own numbers, but I'd say probably about 30 to maybe 40 hours of PVE content, depending on how fast you decide to go through it, as far as like all the bosses and stuff like that and farming up for it. So I, I would say the PVE is maybe 30 to 40 hours. Um, and, and there's a lot of fun stuff to do that is just PVE. You don't have to be on a PVP server. You don't need to, to go through the, the frustration that we went through. Um, you can absolutely either join a PVE server or make your own server. Um, and I do think, and me, Mangu's talked about this a little bit, I think that there's also opportunities for uh, you know community generated end game stuff like we thought about like putting to hosting together uh, like a pvp tournament because there's like an arena on the map and we can you know try and get as many people over there and have like 1v1 tournament or something like that um there's also like a horse racing rink that we could try and get people so there are other things and i'm excited to see again what else they come up with and the adjustments that they make um for the game and see what where it goes but 100 worth the 20 dollars 100 worth playing um it's a, it's, a, it's a really, really, really cool game. And there's probably other stuff that we haven't even discovered yet that, that other people maybe have. So if you play the game and you're in the comments, let us know what you loved and what you hated, <laughs> what you want to see change, because uh, I'd be curious. Yeah, and that is going to wrap it up for this time, for this uh, for this week, for, for, for V Rising. I think next we're going to do <laughs> Diablo Immortal, the uh, mobile slash PC game from Blizzard. And... I, there's probably vampires in that too, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's yeah. close enough. It's yeah. the occult, right? So it's, it's close. yeah, right. <laughs> if, if you want to check out uh, Jelly Knees, I'll have his Twitch and YouTube linked in the comments below. If you want to check out Viking Jedi, I'll have his Twitch and YouTube linked in the comments below. But uh, that is going to close it out for this week. Thanks for coming out, and uh, see y'all later. Man, go. Special shout out to channel members, I Bloodhunter, Jelly Knees, Meow Mix for Men, Stunt, Raven, and Blastoise King.